Thank you, everybody, and welcome to Sterling Photography Festival, Flow 2021. I recognise uh, a number of people signed up for tonight, so it's lovely to see you've got a returning audience for Frank's talk. Um, and uh, I just want to briefly introduce Frank to you. Some of you will know Frank, you'll certainly know his work. Um, we were introduced to Frank earlier on this year through Street Level Photoworks in Glasgow when we set about uh, defining our uh, theme for the year, which was flow. Um, Malcolm and his colleague John there said to me, well, you've got to speak to Frank uh, McElhenney. You're sitting on the River Forth and Frank has done a very interesting piece of work on the River Forth. So we're absolutely delighted that Frank was free and able to work with us um, here at the festival this year and to share with, the, with, with us his project. Um, those of you who don't know Frank, uh, Frank's a graduate of Glasgow School of Art. Uh, he was due to graduate in uh, 2014, the ill fated year when the Macintosh building was destroyed by fire. Um, and the piece of work that he had for his graduate show that year, wasn't, he wasn't able to show it. Um, but he went off uh, and did another piece of work, uh, which is that which he's going to share with us tonight. Um, and this piece of work, I think I'm right in saying, um, Frank uh, won you an award, the Jill Todd Award, um, for a very innovative um, approach and process that you use, which you're going to share with us tonight. And something I think that underpins a lot of your work, Frank, is how you look at the landscape of Scotland and identify how it reflects the history of the country and the stories that tells us of our past. And again, I think tonight you're going to share a little bit about a little bit of that with us as well. So without further uh, ado, I'd like to hand, hand over to Frank and let us get immersed in the River Forth and uh, the project that he did um, shortly after that sort of fateful year in 2014. Frank, if I can hand over to you now, that would be great. Great. Thanks, Janie. Thanks a lot. Um, first of all, thanks everyone for joining. Um, I know from my own experience during the last uh, 18 months that uh, these Zoom meetings are quite frequent now and um, it's, you know, it's time out your day to come and join these. So I really appreciate it. I appreciate your time. Um, as Janie says, there's a couple of things I want to do in this talk. One is really to focus on a project that I did. It seems quite a long time ago now because it was just fresh out of art school, um, 2014. But it's very appropriate um, in the sense that the project was made using a kite, um, flying uh, a camera over the River Forth from the source out to the sea. And the theme of the Stirling Photography Festival this year is flow. Um, so I want to look at that project and but I also really want to talk about the kind of process that I go through making work. Um, I hope that's um, almost of equal interest in a way um, as any one specific project. A few things about myself just to, to start off and introduce. I suppose one of the unusual things about me is, uh, you know, I started so late uh, making work, making art. I went to art school when I was 46, graduated when I was 50 and now I'm 57. So I've always been interested in that, but I've come very late to actually making work myself. Um, so, you know, it's never too late, as they say. Um, the kind of work that I'm interested in, the things that uh, inspire me, I, when I was young, my first degree was in history and philosophy. Um, so a lot of the a lot of the questions I ask myself and a lot of the inquiry that I engage in when trying to make photography is driven by thinking about history and what it means and also how history is used today uh, in various ways. Um, so let me show you a few pictures. Uh, I'll share my screen. I sh last thing to say housekeeping wise is um, I hope there's plenty of time at the end of this for discussion and I really invite questions um, and if you've got any questions that are informational you know that can be quickly answered just fire them away just now you know in the chat and 
hopefully we can answer some of those as we go and anything that requires discussion we'll we'll take up at the end okay so just gonna share this little slideshow okay i hope that people can see my screen thumbs up from anyone just to yep okay good this is kind of like uh the prelude to the project that i'm going to talk about okay um as Janie alluded to, when I was at art school, which was from 2010 to 2014, I worked on a project for three years in the end that was all about um, an event that happened like 700 years ago. Uh, it was the Battle of Bannockburn. Okay, now if you know your Scotty, well, we've got an international audience, so let me explain a little bit here. Um, you know, Scotland at the moment, is and for the past several years um, has had a lot of political discussion about um, the question of independence from the rest of the UK. So that's something that's been up uh, for lively debate. And there was actually a referendum in 2014 in September when people at that time voted to remain within the UK. Um, but in the same year, 2014, there was also this significant anniversary, the 700th anniversary of the Battle of Bannockburn. And what the heck was that uh, from medieval times? Well, Nick, very close to Stirling, where we're having this photography festival, is the village of uh, Bannockburn, which, which is literally a stream. Burn is just a Scottish word for a stream or a small river that flows into a much larger River Forth. And at the time, there were um, medieval wars, a power struggle really to establish kingship um, by the, the Bruce family uh, in Scotland. And it was, in the end, a, a really significant uh, victory for the Scots over the English king. Um, Edward II. So the important bit for me when I started looking into this, because I knew that the history of it would be replayed uh, during the run-up to the referendum on independence because it had this symbolism. But I, so I started visiting the place because you know I've got a background in medieval history and I wanted to just find out and investigate this place for myself. But when I started going there, all I could think about was the fact that more people died in this very small confined space on that single day in our history than on any other day in Scottish history. So several thousand people lost their lives there on a single day uh, in June 13, 14. And perhaps the majority of them drowned because what happened was that the Scottish army, which was much smaller than the English army, actually attacked unexpectedly, attacked the larger force, but penned them into a, a confined space where the burn, which was tidal back then, flowed into the river. And so they pushed the, the larger army back into the water and many of them drowned. So, <laughs> sorry, it's, just, uh, it's quite a bit, bit depressing, <laughs> but um, anyway, the, the, the project that I was doing for my degree show started to look at that, 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 that fact, um, and I ended up writing my dissertation on uh, like death and mortality and art. Um, but anyway, what most of the work that I was making was like pinhole photography, large format pinhole photography, black and white. But I had this problem that I encountered. You could say it was a technical problem. I, kept, I had this picture inside my head, which was what carnage there must have been um, at the point of confluence between the Bannockburn and the River Forth, because you know hundreds, if not thousands of people had drowned in both waterways, and then they met at a single point. And I photographed it from every every place I could get to on the land. I photographed it, 
and it never in any way captured uh, any sense of feeling of what I felt. So I just like was plagued with, well, how do I make a picture that in any way captures the thought, captures the experience uh, of being there and of contemplating the carnage that had occurred there. And so I decided I would make an aerial photograph, but I had no idea how, how you get to make an aerial photograph if you don't have an aeroplane or a helicopter. And I actually uh, went online and found out about the best or cheapest way to do it was to get a kite and just dangle a small camera um, under a kite. So what you're looking at on the screen, that was a very long uh, preamble on the, the prehistory to the, the main project, but this is the single first and only aerial photograph that I made from a degree show at art school. And it shows the confluence between the Bannockburn and the River Forth. And, you know, it, it doesn't look like much, but, you know, it was a turning point for me in terms of uh, thinking about how you could use photography to get a different perspective on things um, for certain applications, you know, uh, yeah, I don't want to expand on it too much, but, you know, there's a relationship between the thinking about the subject and how it has to be visualised. And, and I think an aerial perspective works well in certain circumstances. So that was made on a digital camera with a tiny sensor. Um, so anyway, as, as J Janie intimated there, disaster struck uh, literally on the day when we were finishing our install for our degree show in May 2014. Um, there's an unfortunate accident and the whole, <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, <laughs> but um, the whole place went up in fire and the whole degree show was basically destroyed. So the thing was cancelled and we didn't have a degree show. So um, you can imagine after working hard for four years, and this is the culmination point of your studies, um, you know, it, it's a bit deflating. Uh, you know, you're waiting for this big crescendo and then nothing happens. Uh, in fact, something quite tragic happens and, you know, you, you, the last thing you're really thinking about in a way is your own little project. You kind of was just thankful that nobody actually got hurt in the incident. Um, everybody was safe and that was the main thing. Um, but as it happened, there was this competition that was... Um, advertised at the time, it was the Jill Todd Photography Award. And the theme, by coincidence, that year, happened to be the word flow. And that's the theme of this year's Stirling Photography Festival, flow. And when I thought about that, well, you know, immediately I was struck with um, the fact that making this work, you know, the, 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 use, and the use of a kite, and the flow of air and the river, I thought, well, there's got to be something I can do to extend what I've been doing from a degree, degree show work uh, into this theme of flow. Um, and I'd walked, I'd actually walked this route from Kincardine Bridge all the way out to the sea along the River Forth. Um, so knew a bit about some of the places that were interesting. And off I went with my kite and within, you know, it was literally two weeks after the fire, I started this journey of repeatedly going out along the river and making these kite aerial photographs. And this is a photograph from the first day. So <laughs> um, I should stop laughing because <laughs> I just keep getting these flashbacks. I, I don't know what it's like for you guys, because I'm sure a lot of you are photographers, but whenever I look at a, fo a photograph that I made, could be 10 years ago, I'm back there straight away. I remember everything. Um, and what this one shows is, I this is the source stream that flows into uh, a loch called Loch Chon. And the Loch Chon is the source of the River Forth. Now I had the kite flying with a camera underneath, uh, trying to picture this stream 
and the the wind died down and the kite became becalmed and it fell into the water there. So the the I'd rushed into the water, snatched the camera, gave it a good shake, and then made this photograph. So that's what you're looking at. Um, fortunately, the camera survived. Um, and that is the picture kind of straight after. So this stream, the sorry, the little black dot there is actually a self-portrait. That's me standing uh, on a kind of sandbar there. Behind me is the loch, open water, and in front of me is the stream. And you can see a white line there, which is the kite, kite string. This, um, this is another um, picture of a confluence. And it's where the Kelty water joins the River Forth. And this is one of the reasons why I got a bit hooked on using the kite for making these aerial pictures. I don't know if you can see it clearly on the screen, but there's a certain thing that can happen sometimes when the wind is blowing in a certain way where the kite starts to turn in one direction as well as being blown backwards by the wind. And you get a kind of sweet spot in a sense, like where the swirl of the movement of the, the wind and the kite and the camera means that what's at the center is in focus. And as you move out, it kind of blurs. So it's almost like the effect you have with some particular lenses, like the lens baby lenses or large format lenses if you use your tilt shift in a certain way. These little things that happened when the wind took control were things that I like to see. It just showed things in a different way and brought a different mood to the pictures themselves. Um, this one was made, this is the only one that was made in a, a relative storm. The kite broke when I made this one. This is, um, what's the bridge here? This is, uh, let me just check my notes here. This is the Cardross Bridge. And then the next couple of pictures, pictures were made in Coross or Kuros, I think is how it's pronounced, which is quite tidal. This is an old stone pier, hundreds of years old, I think it's 17th century. And all these footprints here in the, the mud flats, those are yours, the, the footprints of yours truly. So well, one thing I should say is like, when you make, right, I have since making this series used a drone, right? And a drone, does give you more control in terms of where you can move and take the images from. But <laughs> the, one of the beautiful things about using a kite is you just get the kite up above roughly where you want the pictures to be made. And then you kind of wander around and let the wind do the work. And so I didn't know when I was making, the, in this picture, I was trying to make a picture of the, the stone pier. I wasn't aware of the fact that I was leaving this trail of these footprints that would eventually become part of the picture. Um, so those are the kind of accidents that happen that I think we all appreciate sometimes when we, when we make work. And then some of these pictures are quite abstract. Um, this is just the, the shallow waters at uh, Burnt Island, um, the sea. Where, where, where this, the, the fifth or fourth starts to open up um, and to more of a kind of salt, salt water estuary. Um, the beach with some uh, day trippers. And then this one individual is, it's actually my son, um, Connor in the shallows. And this is a place called Crail. We are starting to get out past Ainster into the fishing villages as the estuary opens up. And this is Fife Ness. So below those white water tops, it's basically flat slabs of rock. Um, Fife Ness is a kind of promontory that sticks out. Um, you know, beyond that point, 
is more like open sea. Just around the corner is St Andrews, famous in photo photographic history. Um, a lot of the innovators uh, of uh, the invention of photography uh, did, did early work there and experiments there. That's where I think Helen Adamson are from originally. And then this last picture um, of the series, this was actually made on an island, the Isle of May. So out in the estuary, the fourth estuary, looking out into the North Sea, there's this small island, which is famous for its puffins, actually. Uh, there's a puffin colony there where, where in May and June, you've got like 100,000 puffins. But this was the final image of the of the series, 12 pictures. Um, so it wasn't a large body of work, but, you know, it was a hard one because, you know, for, for nearly two months, all I did was make these trips up and down the river and fly my kite. And kites aren't as reliable as drones. Sometimes there's not enough wind. So you drive all this way and it, it doesn't work. But I think I should say something about, you know, some of the thinking behind it. I mean, I'm talking away about the process and how it was made um, because, you know, it's a bit novel using a kite. But, you know, it was because I'd been thinking a lot about all those lives that had been lost at Bannockburn and the fact that, you know, they weren't buried. Some Many of them were buried in pits, the ones that died in the battlefields, but most people would have been would literally have been pushed into the waterways and just drifted out to sea. I was almost like following the footsteps of this journey of the dead. Um, so it was really a reflection on mortality. But for me, the the river itself is <laughs> it is a kind of an archetypal metaphor for regeneration. You know, it, it, it's these waterways have been there for millions of years, and they'll be there for millions of years to come. And you know, they 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 continually are part of this cycle of regeneration. And I'll be honest with you, you know, like um, my perspective on that has shifted in the last seven years because when I think about climate change now, I don't think I worried that much about. Like, well, I was aware of climate change seven years ago, but I guess I feel it more keenly now. And uh, maybe some of you guys do too. Um, you know, well, but that that's a whole, a whole different subject that uh, maybe people can ask about if they're interested. But uh, it does, does make you think, doesn't it? You know, this natural equilibrium it's been there for millions of years, and now we're at a point where we're actually, as humans, affecting it and disrupting it. Um, so I want to talk now about that. That was, you know, this project that I've shown you is relevant. It's about a, a river that flows through Stirling. Um, the theme was flow, which is this year's uh, theme. But this is really early work for me. This is the first thing that I did coming out of uh, art school. And since then, I've gone on and done projects that are more involved and have meant traveling to different places. And so I just want to touch on a couple of those projects to give you an idea of, you know, how the kind of seeds that are planted early on, you know, develop in different directions um, and Maybe that will feed some of the questions that people want to ask as well. So the very next year after that work was made, um, 2015, there was uh, what's termed the refugee crisis. Um, I don't know if that's a good word to describe it because there's always problems you know, that, that people face. Um, trying to find refuge, but there was a particular sort of focus in the media during 2015 on people trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea. Many lives were lost and many people were reaching Europe 
finding asylum in some countries being, you know, pushed aside by others. And that's a process that hasn't stopped. It's ongoing. I think that COVID probably dampened things down, slowed things down a bit, but now it's starting all over again. And what I spoke about just a minute ago, climate change, um, and let's don't, don't even begin to talk about Afghanistan. Um, there are many reasons why the, you know, this so-called crisis is just an ongoing process that humans are going to have to find ways of dealing with. And, and that really hit me in 2015 when it was highlighted a lot in the media. And I started to think about, well, what can I do as a photographer? You know, this old white guy in the west of Scotland, you know, you know, what, what do you do? It's, it's, it's a struggle. You want to, you want to, you feel empathy. You want to do something. You want to make work that in some way is positive, but you don't want to interfere necessarily or do something that's unethical. So I got, I start, I got to thinking about, well, look, anyone in my family, any of my friends, if I sit, sit and talk to them about, you know, two generations ago, three generations ago. You don't have to go back very far before you find out that we all have a story within our own family of people being forced to move from one country to another, right? And Scotland, of course, is no exception. So the, you know, the classic period in the 19th century uh, in Scotland of people being forced to migrate, we call it the clearances. So in the highlands and islands of Scotland, um, and by the way, the same thing happened in the lowlands, uh, but earlier, um, but in popular consciousness, the, 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 I guess the highland clearances are closer and more within living memory um, because stories handed down uh, from the 19th century. Um, you know, what I thought was, okay, I'll do a project where I photograph abandoned settlements because that's, that's one thing, that's one legacy of uh, the clearances in the Highlands and Islands. Um, you know, they were, these places are very remote. They weren't cleared in order to throw up a Tesco or whatever, because in the middle of, you know, real barren, uh, you know, places, remote places, difficult to get to, they were cleared in order to be, that people and, and uh, you know, potato farming or crop farming could be replaced by sheep ranches, because sheep were more profitable to the landowners than whatever the people were doing there, okay? So the part of the legacy of that is that there are ruined villages or the remains of ruined villages, clachans as they call them, uh, all over the highlands and islands. Practically everywhere you go you today, you'll find these places uh, on you know, windswept shorelines and uh, islands. Uh, and aerial photography, as it happens, was kind of a perfect way to capture them because what remains tends to be foundations that show the kind of plan, the floor plan of the buildings, but not much else is left. Um, so this is a place called Boer Blake on the Ar Ardnamurton Peninsula, up in the west of Scotland, northwest. And then this is the, this is a place called Learable uh, in Sutherland, uh, the Kildonan Valley, I think. Sutherland was one of the worst affected places um, because basically you had uh, absentee landlords uh, who owned huge estates throughout Sutherland and just made the decision that it would be more profitable to put livestock in the land and uh, you know all the all the people who worked the land were pushed off either to migrate to places like North America or to uh, retrain as fishermen on uh, newly created villages like Helmsdale. Um, there's a book that was written, um, God, I wish, I, I think Tom Hunter might be the guy's name, 
uh, and it was called something, I think it was called Set Adrift um, Upon the World was the name of uh, the book and it told the story of uh, what happened to many of the people that were moved out of Sutherland. Uh, and let me think. So, so anyway, um, this series that I created of these abandoned settlements, I actually took that word adrift as, my, as the title of the series, having read that book. So, the next stage of development really, yeah, I'll just quickly show you a couple of other uh, pictures that I made in a more recent project that are aerial photographs. Um, and these two were made with a drone actually. Now, it's kind of, uh, you know, anyone's guess, you know, what, what, what are you looking at now? If you have ever driven past what was the Ravenscraig site in uh, outside Motherwell, um, then you will, you may well remember a very gigantic blue gas storage tank with the word Ravenscraig uh, painted in white on it. So what you're looking at is an aerial view looking down on the cement foundations of where that gas storage tank was. So why, you know, and this was my lockdown project. So my family uh, comes from Craig Nuke, uh, which is right at the gates of the steelworks. And I would look out over my grandmother's house and see that storage tank. So during lockdown, when it was difficult to go places where there were other people, I would go here because there was nobody in sight. It was deserted and you could walk for miles and not see anyone, but maybe a dog walker. Um, but that, um, what I'm trying to do here is make a connection um, where I've started off looking at a huge historical event. Um, I've been spurred to take some of that technical way of working and apply it to a new project, which is about migration, prompted by uh, you know, a, a response to what's happening in the world out there right now, contemporary issues. And then during lockdown, moved it to, in a way, something personal, my own family history. My grandfather uh, helped build this place. So my grandfather uh, was a plate layer. He, he laid the railway tracks into the site and, uh, you know, under, when the whole place was being constructed and then worked for years maintaining, maintaining this. And then I'm just going to end with one last picture here that, um, but I'll talk a little bit about this. So pulling some of the strands together of what I'm doing now, okay? I would say there's two main projects I'm working on now um, or will be. One, I went, I went on a residency at the end of 2019, um, Street Level had, well, are working with a partner in County Donegal in the west of Ireland, northwest of Ireland, called Artlink. And um, they did a residency exchange and I went over and spent a month in Donegal and really kind of, you know, shifted my research because it just dawned on me that I'm doing all this work about migration uh, out of Scotland. And it's a way of trying to talk to people in you know, this community and this society about the contemporary issue of migration and why you know, it's important, I guess, to welcome people, you know, because there but for the grace of God go I. You know, it, it's happened to us all at one point in our in our family history and it happened in Scotland. Um, but it did dawn on me after a while, and I don't know why it took so long, um, that the only reason that I, Frank McElhenney, uh, 
you know, mother's maiden name Durkin. So well, Irish on all sides, you know, the only reason that I'm here in Scotland is because of events that happened in the 19th century in Ireland when there was, in case you don't know, a massive famine, um, you know, triggered in part by a natural disaster, the, the potato blight, but there are all kinds of political reasons why it then became this deadly event that killed a million people and led to the migration of, you know, well over another million people. And 100,000 of those people came to Scotland at that time and then kept coming. Um, in fact, it's only now, um, after 170 years, that the population of Ireland has started to grow again. Can you believe it? You know, there is no parallel in Europe, as far as I know, um, where a country that had 8 million of a population in 1845 um, had a fall in its population down to 5 million, and it's still there today. That's, that's the sort of level of the Irish population today. So it shows you how cataclysmic that event was. And as I say, indirectly, that's how I came to be here. And when I went to this residency in Donegal in 2019, just before lockdown, I started to look into my own family history. And that's why I was looking at places like Ravenscraig during lockdown and thinking about all that. But basically, the guy that helped build Ravenscraig, um, my grandfather, his father came from a farm in Donegal uh, he was born in 1850, during the famine, years, and as soon as he was able, he moved to Scotland um, to work on the railways. Um, so there's all that history there that's personal, but that's not really, I don't, I don't really make work. Uh, I suppose, you know, the, the personal is embedded within the work, but I try and um, broaden out the, the what gets produced and put in the wall or hopefully eventually in, in book form. Now, one small, why have you got a swan on your screen? What's that, what's that got to do with it? Um, maybe it's partly the, the theme of flight and flow, but um, one thing that happened when I went to Ireland in 2019, November, so nearly, nearly two years ago, is, it was winter and there are these great lakes called the Inch Levels um, on Loch Swilly where literally thousands of hooper swans come in from Iceland to overwinter. And I would go and watch them and every single morning at dawn they'd wake up and en masse they'd fly out into the fields. And then at dusk, they'd all start piling back into the lake. And this was an amazing sight to me. And I used to stand there in the dark with my 3200 ISO film, you know, um, badly focused, uh, but just taking hundreds of pictures. I got, became obsessed, I was there for a month. And I probably took several hundred photographs of swans um, because they became a kind of metaphor for migration for me. They, you know, they, come, they come from Iceland every year to Ireland. And uh, it's just, I don't know, the, the, the sight of them, the, 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 the sound, you know, like as they came, you know, making their, their honking noise as they all come in and back out again but also the flap of their wings because they're so close because they're, they're really just taking off or landing. And you really hear their feathers and wings flapping loudly. There was just this really visceral presence of these, these birds um, that I'm developing now. Um, so, so you kind of like, it's an odd thing, the way things come together. I don't think, I think that, there is an obvious metaphor there because of migratory birds, but I also think there's a connection back to flow and flight and the aerial photography. And it's taken a different turn, but that's how the work develops. 
you just follow your nose sometimes and uh, new new corners are turned. But it's all connected. It's all connected. So I don't know if that talk makes much sense, but I hope it sparks off a few questions. Um, I, um, I'm happy to... Well, I will say one last thing. I'll talk about the where, yeah, where that project is going. So, um, just to look ahead a bit, okay, and then I'll, we'll, we'll finish and take questions. So, for that project, I've got an exhibition coming up in Letterkenny, the regional culture regional cultural centre of Donegal, um, in sort of like the middle of October. That will run for a couple of months. If anyone was in Donegal, they can go and see the exhibition. Um, but while I'm over there, I'm going to go over do the install. I'm just going to take the car over in a tent and I'm going to drive down the west coast of Ireland from the very north tip, Malin Head, down past Skibbereen. The, 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 the western and southern parts of Ireland were the worst affected by the famine. Okay, the, the, you know, the, the, the attrition rates, people dying and leaving was much higher there than in, say, the, the, the kind of what's now today Northern Ireland, which is more industrialised. Um, so I'm going to make that trip and make photographs uh, of that journey. Because a lot of what happens in my work is I make these journeys and I don't really know 100% what I'm going to photograph until I'm on that journey. I just know where I need to be to do the search, to, to, to try and find the pictures that somehow connect with what's going on at the back of my brain. Um, and, and I don't, and when, when you think about a subject that's as big and as sensitive as say the, the Irish famine and the migration that ha happened on the back of it, um, When you look at memorials and artworks that have been made about that, they, they can often be very head on, you know, like, you know, a lot of more memorials show you statues of, you know, wretched, starving people and things like that. And that's not really my way. Uh, uh, there's a Vietnamese filmmaker who, um, you know, work, makes work on trauma. Min, Min Ha is her name and she, she uses this phrase, speaking nearby okay and, and, and i think that when you're trying to make work about difficult histories and traumatic past events that that's a good phrase speaking nearby sometimes think it's better to approach things from an oblique angle than than head on uh, when it, especially when it's really complex and difficult subjects but it's important i know I, maybe I shouldn't even say this, but I was reminded how important it is when two days ago, you know, part of our legacy here in the west of Scotland, there was a football match uh, and many of the, some of the football supporters went through the centre of Glasgow and it was on all the internet videos and, and they were singing, the famine is over, why don't you go home? Okay, so... You know, I'm not going to start on with politics or, or, or religion <laughs> here and now, but I'm just making the point that, it, weirdly, after 170 years, the prejudice that, that goes on the back of those cataclysmic events actually still is there beneath the surface, you know, with a minority of people. And, and I think it, it's important still to take those sparks from, you know, history and you know you know make something of it shine a light on it not just because there's these lingering raw net raw sores but because of what's happening in the world today you know you know only need to say one word afghanistan and you know what i'm talking about you know migration is a live issue if anything that will become more significant through time and, you know, I think that we all as humans have a responsibility to consider how, consider 
how we can be more, I guess, welcoming, empathetic, accommodating to our, our fellow humans, no matter where they come from. And I'll leave, I'll leave it there. Thanks. That's great there, Frank. We've got um, a line of questions coming in for you. Um, some interesting ones we've got first here. Janie is asking, um, what camera did you use um, and how did you control the shutter on it? Ah, okay. Um, technical question. That's an easy one. Um, well, so, some for that particular series, I used a, um, a Ricoh GR, which is a digital camera, and it has an intervalometer on it. So that you can program it to literally take a photograph every five seconds. And that's what I did. So it takes all the stress away because... Um, I don't want to get too technical, but if you've got a, a drone, you can actually uh, get stuff that lets you see what the camera sees and then click the button when you want. I never do that. Even when I'm flying a drone, I just set the camera up with a five second intervalometer and fly it in the general area of what I, where I want it to be and then leave it to chance. And then you get... <laughs> you get the delayed reaction joy of then seeing the photographs afterwards. So it's not quite as good as film, but it approaches it in some level. And then we've got Lindsay's asked, is there a reasoning behind the series of photographs being black and white? Yeah, um, I suppose that's, that's a bit of an aesthetic choice, really. Um, I think that... Um, you know, a personal preference. I, I do make some projects in colour, but um, I think that uh, there's so many reasons why I prefer black and white. Um, one is, I'll just, I'll just say it. Right? I do prefer, I do like the look of black and white film grain. <laughs> okay, all right. I like chocolate and I like black and white film grain. I've said it. Uh, I don't know if that's really defensible, but, but it's, the, it's the truth. So that's one thing. Um, but I think um, when you take the colour out, when you, when you just concentrate on light and dark and the tones, it does have a, a harmonising effect on the pictures in a series. Um, and I think that I don't know, maybe, maybe it's the relationship to history and things like that. Um, um, the pictures hopefully allude to something outside of the, the, what's in the frame, yeah? And by making them in black and white and having that, that harmony across the series, um, I think that can make them a little bit more powerful in communicating that. I don't know, I'm not explaining that very well, um, but that's an answer for now. That's a good answer. <laughs> um, uh, John's asked, whose point of view is represented by adopting the aerial approach to the pictures? Whose point of view? Yeah, when you were talking yeah. about um, all the different yeah. views. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, I, um, I enjoy looking at, aerial photography, but there's very different types of aerial photography um, that, you, that you have. So <clears throat> there's, there's a whole school of American photographers who have for the last 30 years or so um, made environmental work. So there's some really big names that you would know, like, well, Canadian would be Edward Bertinsky. Um, uh, and then in America, you've got people like David Mazel or Emmett Gowen. Um, and they would use uh, helicopters or aeroplanes. And, and Bertinsky, in particular, talks about the God's eye view. Okay? You know, you heard it right, the God's eye view. And, and, and then, you know, taking a step back from them, you get, you know, and, and that's very much a kind of, you know, God's eye documentary view, like showing, um, showing us little humans um, what devastation we've wreaked upon the land uh, in terms of environmental change, you know, mining or 
Um, it could be construction, but you know, largely it's the environmental impact of some of our large scale industries that they want to show through that work. Um, as if you were God on high, seeing all these little humans running around causing havoc. And, and, and I kind of, that, that work gets critiqued sometimes, you know, for, for, you know, creating this sublime view, almost aesthetically pleasing view of, the, of carnage and destruction. But I think, you know, we are objective enough that we can look at those images and see them for what they are. And that is, they're shown as information that does make abundantly clear um, factually what, what we are doing to the earth. So I do, I do see value in that. Taking a step back, um, I'll, I'll, I'll name someone from Scotland, Patricia MacDonald, who I really admire. She's a, a more poetic approach to aerial photography where um, she's concerned, I think, with environmental issues, but um, I would just recommend that you have a look at her work. Um, the things, you know, she'll make, often make work in series where the images relate to one another. But, but what I'm doing, okay, is certainly not from a God's eye view, okay? <clears throat> There's an expression <laughs> that I've, I've thought about this uh, in a way. Um, my my um, aerial photography, I would say, is earthbound aerial photography, okay? The, the, I'm never flying over the land when I'm making this work. I'm always walking through the land. I'm always earthbound. And whether it's a kite or occasionally a drone, I never actually see what the camera sees until I, I get it down out of the sky. So it's, it's a little bit more restricted and in a, in a way it's a bit more human and humble than what uh, the, the more successful, I guess, and popular aerial photographers ha have done in the past. Um, but it works for me. It's a more intimate view of some of these landscapes that I'm interested in. Yeah. Um, and there, Frances has asked, um, she said, you mentioned connection. Uh, how much is it that the connection those connections guide your lens um, versus planning activities. How does it make you feel when you find that connection? So can you repeat that question? Because I just saw John's comment uh, saying that it's a legal high. <laughs> uh, yeah, no problem. It's just Francis asking, um, yeah. how much is it these um, connections you're seeing guide your lens um, over planning the activities that you're doing, planning going to these places? And when you find these connections um, at locations, how does that make you feel? Yeah, I, I, I think there's two parts to that. Um, the, um, sometimes I'll be honest, I don't realize what the connections were until I've done the next part of work and I think, oh, that's how that happened, yeah. Um, so I don't think that the connections are you know, there's not much necessarily foresight. Um, it, as I go, progressively I learn and make the connections. Um, but what I would say is one of the, um, yeah, so I usually have a loose framework. Like I know I'm going to go and uh, travel down the west coast of Ireland and make photographs. My expectation is that, you know, I have confidence uh, and faith that somehow things will fall into place and things will start to make sense. And the way that that happens is I make discoveries and connections along the journey. You know, it's all about the journey, man. <laughs> but uh, as my kids would say, um, but it's true, you know, in a sense, you know, um, the great thing about being a photographer or a certain type of photographer is you get out in the world and you engage with the world, okay? so. History, you know, I'm steeped in history and I read lots of books, but it comes to lie to, to life when you go out into the world and you meet people, talk to people, you know, which sounds bizarre because most almost ever a photograph is landscapes, not people, but I'm talking to people all the time and you make discoveries. So the Swans is a good example. 
right? When I went on that residency for a month, I knew I would go and track down the field that my great grandfather had farmed before he came from Donegal to Scotland. I knew I would do that. I did not know that I would end up based in a place called Buncrana, a few miles away from this great lake where thousands of swans fly in and out every day. That was a discovery. That was a connection that I made whilst there in the moment and said, I've got to photograph this, this, what is the word, this phenomenon and just did it repeatedly. And, and um, as I say, made hundreds of pictures and that will all become part of the work when it's exhibited. Um, that was a bit of a waffly answer that I'm afraid, but uh, sorry, Francis. Well, we got an answer for it. That's what matters. <laughs> um, when you're talking about the swans there as well, um, Poppy has asked, how did you select the photo of the swan that you chose um, out of the hundreds that you took? Yeah, um, th th that, the, I guess that's the, a simple one to answer is that most of the photographs that I've made had lots of swans together because they'd come in in, in like V-shaped formations and I would make photographs with, um, you know, six, 12, whatever it was, smaller groups sometimes, but rarely do you get a solo swan coming in and then that particular photograph. Um, I, I shot, made that one picture of that one swan and just um, the simplicity of it, I think is what works for me. Um, just that one isolated form. And, and here's a, little secret, if it is a secret, um, because the swans are flying in in relative darkness, um, you know, the print that you saw is actually on a direct positive paper. Okay, so, so what you're really seeing is um, a dark shape. Sorry, as I stand there in the field watching these swans come in, the, the, what would be a white swan if it was daylight, is actually darker than the sky. So in order for me to show you in a print a white swan, I have to print it on direct positive paper and it reverses everything round. Great, yeah. Um, after that, Janie has asked, um, you are charting um, historical migrations. Um, through the, photo the photography, uh, what do you think the role of photographers should be in response to the contemporary migrations and refugee crisis um, that's going on right now? I, d I mean, that's a difficult question to answer because I think every photographer has to find their own path. I mean, that's a, a glib answer. Um, for me, as I said, I think that um, my approach, and that's the thing, you know, I, you know, I, I was listening to a podcast earlier today um, by a photojournalist. Her name's Alexandra Fizine or something, uh, I think it's name, but she made a book called A Million Shillings, where she, you know, worked very closely with people who were Somalian refugees that were fleeing from the country. And I would say that that, you know, a documentary approach where you actually go and live in a country or with people that are making that journey and gain their trust, work with them collaboratively um, with a strong sense of an ethical approach. Yeah, that, that's one way that a photographer can tackle the subject and do something positive in these crazy circumstances we, we find ourselves in. It's not my approach, I'm an old guy for one. Um, but also really um, my approach to tackling the subject is often a bit more abstract or um, tangential, you might say. So for me, I like, I, I used that phrase earlier about um, speaking nearby, you know, finding a way to talk about the subject, make pictures about the subject, but it's not necessarily what you see within the frame, within the frame. Um, so when I make this work about Ireland and going, you know, going down the West Coast, I'll be thinking all the time about the famine. I'll be thinking all the time about migration. But that's not necessarily, you're not going to see that in the pictures. You're not going to see, 
you know, like I said, the monuments of the famine usually show starving people. Well, you're going to see landscapes. Um, and I don't know yet how I'm going to connect what the photographs show to what I'm thinking in my head. I'm going to have to find that out on the, on the way. And that's the challenge. Yeah. Um, the next question I'm seeing there, um, Kathy is asking, um, she's saying, uh, Bertinsky shows us large, expansive scenes, whereas uh, you have a lot more intimacy to your images. Do you think that's because even before you realised that you were born of immigrants, that you felt connected to that history? Um, I'm not sure about that. I think that um, there's another expression I learned at art school. Uh, it was, do what, do what you can with what you have, okay? Do what you can with what you have. I, I, I had no idea how to make an aerial picture, but I knew I needed to make one for that Bannockburn project. So I got on the internet and I found out that I, there was a guy who would, was giving out kites to people free of charge for archeological photography projects, uh, academically uh, oriented. So it was by chance that I tracked this down and found this generous man that had this program going and uh, went out and made my little pictures with a digital sensor that's the size of a you know, five pence piece, tiny. Edward Bertinsky and the like have huge resources at their you know, command. Uh, you, know, you could call them the great white photographers of the West. Um, and you know, he's got helicopters and airplanes that he can use. So, you know, I, I'm guessing that part of the way that I work is driven by circumstance. You know, maybe if I had the choice and I was 30 years younger, I would have started doing what some of those other guys doing. You know, I'm not criticizing them. You know, I, I, I admire their work in some ways, but I feel, I think I feel more comfortable working on the scale that I do and, and in a more intimate way. Um, you know, I can, for example, when I work in the dark room, you know, I could print my, from my negatives, I could print 20 by 24, but I typically don't do that. Um, I often usually print smaller prints. Um, I like working that way. I like things that you can hold in your hand. Yeah. What's, uh, if you're going to make traditional prints, the part of what attracts you to it is mate the materiality of it. Um, so, you know, while I admire the grand scale, um, for me personally, I'm quite comfortable working on a smaller scale. Yeah, uh-huh. Um, I think you just answered there the question Megan was asking about what inspired you to use the kite for the photography rather than the drone. But I suppose also then, um, was it more than just the uh, restrictions you had that uh, attracted you to the kite? I'll be honest, it was completely practical in the first instance. I'm like, I have to make this picture. I have to make this one picture. I've gone and stood at the side of the, the River Forth, looking over at the confluence where the burn comes in. I've made photographs, um, didn't like them. Went to the other side of the river, made them from that angle, didn't like them. And, and the degree, you know what it's like, you've got this imperative, your degree show is coming up. You've got to have the picture that's in your head. So the fastest way to do it was not to go and think about buying drones and learning how the electronics work. It was, oh, there's a guy that can give me a kite and I can just give that a bash and, and get it done in time. Um, so it was needs must at that point. Uh, but, once, but once bitten, always smitten, right? You know, as soon as I tried the kite and I got a picture I liked, I thought, oh, what can I do next? <laughs> Yeah, I love, I love, I love the feel of it, and uh, to the point where, you know, as a guy in his fifties, I'll now go on holiday with the kids or whatever, and I'll fly a kite for fun, you know, and I never used to do that before. That's great. <laughs> um, next, we've got uh, Kathy asking, do you expect viewers to see your images about the famine? Um, and think about the famine and the migration too when they see them? Or does it not matter to you what they're thinking of when they see them? 
I think if the work's successful, then there would be a, an evocation of those cataclysmic events that occurred back then and the impact that they had. Um, but if it was really successful, they'd make a connection to contemporary migration. So I'll tell you a story. When I was out there on that um, residency in November 2019, I was sat <clears throat> on my own and I've been thinking about this, you know, obviously migration to and from Scotland and Ireland. Um, and I was sat re reading the Sunday newspapers there and there was an article about Ireland's migration policies and the success or not thereof. There was a couple of stories there where it told of um, Achill Island in Mayo and um, Moville in Donegal, places where recently immigrants arriving to Ireland had been burned out of their homes. And I just, it's like a knife cutting through your heart. You know, it's like, my God, this country that suffered so much, uh, you know, and has has is steeped in this history of a loss of its people throughout the world, you know, um, are now faced in a situation where a few hundred people are coming here uh, as refugees from war in other parts of the world, and they're being burned out of their homes. I, 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 I was shocked. Um, maybe I shouldn't have been, but I was shocked. And um, it just spurred me on all the more to try and make the work and try and make it successful in terms of the way it communicates. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, well, with the contemporary stuff you're talking about there, uh, Janie brought up um, the phrase you mentioned, do what you can with what you have. She's asking, what are your thoughts on how we can support those left in Afghanistan, given all the resources, the technologies that we have access to as photographers? That's a, that's a hard one, because of course that's straying away from art into the political. Um, you know, I mean, I was never a, a fan, personally, I was never a fan of intervention in the first place uh, in terms of military. Um, but obviously the, the, the way in which the withdrawal has happened has just created massive other problems. Um, it's beyond me, to, to be honest, it's beyond me to, to, to say how the West can improve a situation that has done so much to create almost, you know? I mean, this is, this is the, in terms of the Brit Britain, Britain's role in Afghanistan, this is our third war in Afghanistan. This is the third time we've uh, invaded and withdrawn from that country and left a mess behind us. So we're not really the people to solve the problem, I don't think. Um, but look, on a, <laughs> so, so as not to be completely depressing, here is one very positive thing that we can do, and that is this. As many people as want to leave that country and come to the UK or America or anywhere else that was invade that had invaded that country, let's open the doors and let them in, facilitate their migration as much as possible, and let them resettle elsewhere. But I don't know if that's you know that that's not a solution. It's just a way of dealing with one of the symptoms uh, of the problem. Yeah. Uh huh. Very poignant stuff. Um, John brought up um, a quote there. He's um, quoting Mark Twain saying, history may not repeat itself, but it rhymes. And then uh, Francis, um, Francis hasn't put in a question and she's just given a comment. And she's saying that those kite images with the blur, the angle they're at and the tethering uh, by the string, they feel alive. Um, likewise, the grainy swan in flight there's a human connection there. They bring life and intimacy to the cleared houses. And she's saying thank you very much for that. Um, I was going to ask as well there, um, you were mentioning the 
theme of mortality a lot in your work that you've been doing. Is there any other themes that you gravitate towards other than that? So there's another big project that's on the horizon uh, <laughs> I didn't speak about, which is <clears throat> the re- kind of returning, I guess, to um, the whole theme of independence. Okay, so so on the one hand, we've got this migration theme, but always underlying over the last several years has been this thing about independence. I mean, I, you know, was never a strong, you know, I'm not a nationalist. I would, I'm not a Scottish nationalist, I would say, but, but, and it took a long while for me to think through the whole independence thing, but um, <laughs> the way things have gone, uh, uh, I guess I've become more of a, uh, supporter of independence um, but look what it does Ray, you know forget all the politics for a minute okay um, because art is not politics it's, it's different <laughs> um, I have a question and that question is this what is Scotland right you know it, I've travelled a lot through the country I've been to the Northern Isles and the Western Isles several times you know everywhere you go people have a different conception of what Scotland is and what it might be and if I think about photographic work in particular we've never really had an overarching treatment of Scotland as a nation you know what what is Scotland you know asking probing that question and it's a shame because if you look at a country like America um, uh, you know you've got a huge tradition of people probing that question of you know what is America what is America today you know uh, how is America uh, in this new time or you know post-war or whatever it might be Um, constantly the the many photographers poke at that question Uh, and some of them have been very successful in for example making photo books that that you know they don't they don't answer pro they don't answer all the questions but they 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 provide insights let's say that are valuable um into the identity or character of that great country um and i and i, I think that would be a project i'd love to do you know i you know not not this year i'm, I'm still working on my irish project and that will be ongoing but i think in the next calendar year once covid restrictions hopefully are not not just COVID restrictions are gone, but the, <laughs> the the rates that we have at the moment, we hope they are reduced. Um, I'm going to start doing traveling again through all the different parts of Scotland. And the plan would be, the loose plan would be, there's 32 council areas in Scotland. And I would make sure that I visited every one of those different council areas. Because what I feel with the tradition of... Um, photographic coverage of Scotland is there's a huge bias to certain things. So, you know, there's a lot of work made about wild and remote places or dying ways of life, which could often focus on, you know, rural communities or whatever. And then conversely, you've got this great tradition of social documentary photography focused on cities and poverty. So you've got these kind of extreme things going on, but Nobody ever really tries to say, cast a wide net and, and try and make sense of the whole damn thing and how those different bits fit together. Because that's what you kind of need to do if you want to understand the country and how, how it can work as, a, as an independent nation, if, if indeed that is the route that we take in the future. Yeah, I would invite anyone um, just in the chat, give us your thoughts on uh, what is Scotland? And if that'd be any use to you, Frank, in your uh, upcoming project, then go ahead and use it. I, what I was thinking there, and um, when you asked that, um, I would describe Scotland, Scot- Scotland's a home. Even if I think of people that I know who um, have migrated to Scotland from somebody else, or even people who've just stopped off um, for a year or two, um, they always feel a, a big a great affinity with the place um, and they come back or people who've come here they really want to stay it feels very homely and my experience and the people that I've spoken to mm-hmm. does anyone else have any input 
got Lindsay agreeing there. Have you had other um, input on that from other places, Frank? In terms of what people think Scotland is? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I don't, I think that all I would say at the moment is, if I knew the answer, I wouldn't be doing the work, right? Um, the reason for wanting to go out and make that journey is because it is, a complex question to which I have no reasonable answer right now. Okay, my, my experience, the, 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 one of the motivators is my experience is that if I'm in the Orkneys or if I'm in the Western Isles or if I'm in uh, the Central Belt and I have a discussion with people about, um, you know, the Scottish nation and what it might become, I'm going to get a completely different perspective depending on the local uh, area that I'm in um, and voting patterns and all the rest of it reflect that as well by the way um, so um, that diversity is part of what motivates me to try and make this fairly epic journey to try and make sense of it all how it fits together there is no one answer but there's got to be some kind of synthesis that gives you allows you to make sense of it all. Kath is just putting in there saying she honestly thinks it's too diverse to get a simple answer on that. Um, She's right. <laughs> <laughs> and Francis Scott is putting in um, make sure to call it Orkney and never the Orkneys. <laughs> <laughs> An island did herself. Yeah. Very good. That's lovely. Um, and that's probably a witty little note to stop on there, Francis. Um, yep. I promise never to call it the Orkneys myself. Um, Frank, thank you very much. That was indeed a journey. Um, and a lot, it provoked a lot of thoughts there and touched on a lot of issues that we're all kind of facing um, at the moment. Um, but I picked up one thing that you said, which will stick with me, which is as I go, progressively I learn. Mm. And I think that's a piece of wisdom, actually, that you know we could all take away around uh, just continuing to learn and grow from what we experience as we go. Um, so thank you very much again uh, for that. And I just want to highlight to everyone that um, Frank's exhibition uh, of this collection of work will be on uh, display at the Maiden Stirling, 44 King Street Artist Collective between the 7th and the 24th of September. If you'd like to come along and actually see Frank's uh, original work hanging there uh, in that lovely space. Um, there may be some other events that we organize around that uh, exhibition um, or in that exhibition space. So just follow our social media and our event right to see those events pop up. Um, but finally, a huge big thank you to Frank for tonight. So give you a big round of applause, Frank. Absolutely brilliant. Thanks for sharing. Thank you guys for all attending. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And follow us on social media and see what other events are popping up. Still a few to be posted. But thanks again, and we'll say good night. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye. Mm -hmm.